Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're delighted to have this returning guest. We've had him on only a few times before. I met Kerry Lutz, the founder of the Financial Survival Network at the Liberty Mastermind Symposium in uh, Dallas, Texas, and saw him again at the next Liberty Mastermind Symposium uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Kerry, thank you for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Hey, it's a pleasure to be back with you again, Dunnigan. You have a recurring set of very intriguing guests on your channel talking about factors that are affecting the macroeconomic and geopolitical uh, events that are around us and specifically how those play out on people's financial survival and reducing risk to their finances. We'd like to talk with you about, and just for those keeping track at home, today is Wednesday, January 30th, 2019. Uh, we'd like you to talk to us about what are the major actions in the gold market and what factors do you believe are driving those big changes that we're seeing now after so many years in the gold market. Yeah, I wish I could give you a complete explanation of this, and um, I can give a partial explanation. And, you know, if we assume without getting into gold price manipulation, precious metals uh, manipulation, which is alive and well, but has too much of the uh, ring of conspiracy theory to it. Let's just assume that the markets really were functioning the way they were supposed to be the past eight years. And, you know, gold reached a peak of uh, just under $2,000. The ounce, I think it was in October of 2011. And I know it was 2011. It was very soon after I started podcasting financial survival network full time and it really did retrace um, a good portion of its prior uh, prior uh, leg up uh, it went down it hit around a thousand dollars and it languished around the eleven twelve hundred dollars for years um, for the past few years it's been uh, between eleven hundred and thirteen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. been in a very narrow channel, and that is something that when it breaks that channel, it's very bullish. So, just from a market standpoint, I know there are people out there. I've had guests on who just say the price doesn't matter. The uh, Federal Reserve, the powers that be, can just set the price of gold at whatever they want it to be, and maybe there's some truth to that. But in retrospect, when you look at it, um, it got into it went way too high, way too fast, and then it uh, it got slammed and fell back to earth. So, you know, there's a lot of explanations for it, and you know, just strictly market forces, it's not altogether irrational. You can say, well, the world was horrible all this time, economies, you know, Europe crashing, well. At the same time, the stock market was going up dramatically. It quadrupled from uh, its low point of uh, of 2009, uh, and it's it's four times the the uh, value the, what it was. So when you investors see that type of return, uh, they might think that things are going to fall apart eventually. But they're in inevitably once once their fears get assuaged. Uh, you're going to invest where the return is. And the return was in the stock market. Nobody can deny that. And to a lesser degree in bonds. And now that picture appears to be changing, although I'm not sure how much. But I think there's a real fear trade going on here, that things are kind of spiraling perhaps out of control, that uh, the balance of power in the world is shifting, et cetera, and therefore... Um, the interest of the risk hedge, which precious metals have traditionally provided to investors, 
is now returning and it's partly the cycles it's partly the world geopolitical situation uh, perhaps there's some manipulation involved you have to figure if there's manipulation to the downside there can always be manipulation to the upside just like we saw in uh, cryptocurrencies which uh, i took to call calling kleptocurrencies quite a long time ago because most of them were scams there were thousands of them now very few of them really exist it's hard to find anybody who's going to get excited about cryptocurrencies including myself in terms of uh what's real and what's not real uh one of the things i wanted to also ask you about was people's desire to reduce risk that's your financial survival network the word survival in there i assume is because there's a real uh risk that people may not survive financially depending on what sorts of upsets can occur if we could start with the most um I would guess easy to discuss with people, and that's uh, like severe weather events. You uh, bravely live in Florida, which is known for uh, hurricanes every season. So what kinds of measures do you personally uh, think are important for people to take when severe weather can be a factor? Or what do some of those who you know, acquaintances or or so on, who you admire, uh, what kind of preparations do they make to prepare for severe weather events uh, living there in Florida? Yeah, well, it's it's a good uh, question because I actually went through a hurricane, first one, uh, left my home, uh, trying to get to a part of the state where, which was less prone to uh, get hit by the hurricanes, and it actually got hit worse than my area did mm. uh, back during Hurricane uh, Marie Maria last year, uh, actually a year before last. In 2017, that I was guess. the third punch of the triple triple punch. Was it uh, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, or Maria? Yeah, Maria. Yeah, Maria was like really hit Florida. They thought it was going to envelop the entire state and submerge it. But you know, uh, this is what the media does. I never thought that, but um, sometimes it's wise. So I actually got to test out my plan. So I figured, well, we're not in a situation where. Uh, Food is going to be an issue. I'm going to be up in Orlando. I could always go over to Disney and get something to eat. So I didn't bring my emergency preparedness food. I found, managed to find a very sketchy motel that I wound up staying <laughs> one night in. I mean, there were guys with prison tattoos. Uh, it was a welfare hotel. Uh, it was quite, uh, quite the place. It wasn't dirty or anything. It just was like <laughs> seedy. And uh, so... You know, having your self-defense tools with you at all times is an absolute must, okay? Uh, Nothing happened to me. Nobody challenged me or anything, but they definitely looked like they were checking me out to rob me. Hmm. Pulled up in this place in a nice car. So uh, I was armed the entire time during uh, my... And then luckily I was a... Because once I realized that the hurricane was going to hit Orlando, then a lot of people canceled out and I got into a better place. So I didn't have to worry about that. So, you know, I wound up schlepping a lot of water up and down steps because the elevators went out because the power had gone off. Ah. So, you know, you have to consider when you're taking water up and down the stairs, you know, water weighs a lot of weight. And then uh, the other thing that happened was, you know, my alarm my computers, everything when we lost power in my home, shut down. The alarm lasted for about, uh, you know, about a day. And uh, that made me realize I needed additional backup batteries. Ah, so this is a um, a normally uh, line-powered house uh, burglar alarm, that kind of thing, but it has a battery backup in case of a power outage. Yes, and and what I realized is, and I'll do this later on because I've just moved again, Uh, having some type of backup generator with fuel is an absolute must. And, uh, you know, because a lot of times you're you're not going to be able to actually abandon your home. I mean, I got out a few days before everyone else did. So, and then I learned about gasoline, um, that you got to stick to the major highways, to the toll roads. Those gas stations there are franchised out by the state and only for major oil companies there's no distributors there's no independent business people so when you see shell oil 
on a marquee on a service area uh, on the highway, mm -hmm. a major highway. You know, we're talking like uh, you have your toll turnpike there, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, right. with the, the Florida Turnpike. Uh, that is supplied directly by and managed by the major oil companies, whether it's Exxon, Chevron, whatever. So when they call for a truckload of fuel, they go to the front of the line. And uh, also in Florida and many other states, the state troopers are often, their barracks are often located right by these, these uh, service areas. So they keep order in this area. There were state troopers directing traffic at all of these service areas. So this was three nights before the hurricane. There's no gas in any of the stations except the ones where there are. There's people lined up for two hours. I get on the uh, turnpike and I go one exit to the service area. I waited five minutes and the troopers were there. So, you know, it was orderly. So th those are things that you can learn from these disasters. Having a backup source, a generator, whatever, um, is crucial. Having backup power for all of your all of your equipment for as long as you can afford to keep it running, you have to do it. Um, the food, like I said, wasn't an issue. But if I was stuck at home and the supermarkets were closed for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. I, I have a year's supply of food, emergency preparedness food that I got substantially discounted from a former sponsor back when uh, everybody was prepping. Uh, everyone's gotten complacent now. Those companies are not doing that well. But back in 2011, 12, man, we were like kicking butt. The sponsors were like uh, raking in money uh, on the on the food. So, okay. so those are some things that I learned. You know, you, you gotta, you know, disaster hits. You have to be armed. Okay, there's no two ways about it. Um, you have no choice. So whatever your state's laws are, learn them and uh, figure out how you get get yourself armed in that situation. And and then you need your bug out kit. You need to be able to get out. Um, you know, you might not be able to get internet. I was able to get it. We never lost it. But in California, I was there during the fires, mm -hmm. uh, fortunately south of them a little bit by only a couple of miles. The cell towers went down and the uh, infrastructure was gone. No internet. So, you know, you got to have like a really robust plan. Don't get a crummy data plan for your cell phone because that might be your lifeline to reality here, to everything. And, um, you know, that was something that uh, you have to really consider. So, uh, you know, getting a full tank of gas, important. Um, Sometimes, look, I, I had a relative who was ill nearby, so I didn't want to, like, totally leave the state. But I could have easily hopped on a plane, gone up to my kids in New York. Everything would have been fine. I would have avoided it. Uh, but I didn't really want to leave my home and, you know, see what damage it encountered because it might be hard to get back. So you have to kind of weigh those things. And having some precious metals that are easily accessible, preferably not stored in your own home, is a good thing because, you know, that could be, you might be living off that uh, that value for longer than you might think. Several so. of the points that you touched on there, and this is all sobering because you actually lived through this, um, and I'm imagining over the years, how, how many years have you been in Florida? Well, it's seven years now. We, that was the first hurricane. There was one a couple of years before, but it didn't, it wasn't going to be a bad one like that. And, you know, the structures, the houses here, especially the newer ones, like I live in a newer home, it's got hurricane glass. It's got garage doors that are Miami-Dade certified, which are the strongest garage doors you can get. And, um, and the, you know, the structure, it's probably, unless it gets to 200 miles an hour, yeah, you could have roof damage, but the structure itself is going to survive. You talked about the need to stay connected that you had relative uh, there uh, i was going to ask you about that was it just you yourself that was that was really it was bugging out or did you have communications with other family members uh, around that about your plan so they know where you were going and you knew what they were going to be doing 
Oh yeah, like I went with a friend. I couldn't really take the sick relative. She could not travel, mm -hmm. and uh, she stayed put. And that turned out to be an okay decision for for that particular storm. But it could have just as easily turned out to be a disaster. So yeah. uh, she was uh, everything was okay. You know, where I left got hit less than in Orlando, where I wound up. So. You know, it it all worked out. So, but you, you mentioned the need for a uh, for like a bug out bag or, or that has your supplies you need to go with. Um, that hit me in a in a tough way uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, my wife and I were driving back into our neighborhood just about sundown, and we saw our neighbors, most uh, several of them, walking around in their front yards, and we thought this is kind of really weird. What's going on? And we rolled down the window and asked one, and they said, well, there's been a major gas break, a gas line break. that They were doing some new home construction just about a block from where we are. And evidently a backhoe had punctured a gas line, and you could smell it. And uh, my wife's brother, my brother-in-law, had been working for uh, in the Twin Cities for a city as an electrician on their, on their uh, streetlights when a major similar construction gas line break explosion took out an entire city block of houses caused many severe uh, burn trauma victims and he got called on just because he was a, a city worker with a truck nearby and he had to go haul severely injured burn victims to a local uh, burn center uh, even mm -hmm. though he's just an electrician by trade um, and so I knew that that could be a serious situation so we thought we got to get out of here until they figure out what's what's the size of this problem is but we realized we were not adequately prepared so we quickly got the dogs, got in the car, and, and got farther, you know, different side of town. But we realized as as the sun went down, I guess now we're going to have to, are we going to go stay at a hotel? If so, we didn't bring our, like, our one-night bags so we could, our medication and the dog's food and stuff like that. And we realized, man, we just did not really have ourselves set up for a quick a quick relocation. And uh, what you're describing, you had a, it sounds like a few more, a little bit more time to make your move. Uh, but you really had to consider some factors about what you were willing to leave behind. And that was the next question I wanted to ask you about your home and your belongings and things. And you mentioned you touched on precious metals uh, just as you went through that story. But um, what consideration, because certainly silver has been one of the most undervalued assets that people have talked about during this whole eight-year grind we've had since 2011. Oh, yeah. um, but if you own a significant amount of silver and have it stored at home, you're talking, <laughs> that weighs more than all the, the case of water that you're carrying up those stairs if you, uh, potentially. Yeah. So uh, uh, what do you, yeah. <laughs> what was your advice to people uh, about protecting hey. their home? You know, a thousand dollar face value bag of pre-1965 silver coins, uh, is 700 some odd ounces of silver and it weighs like 60 pounds and it's really hard to carry so you're not i don't know how much you have or whatever but if you've got a lot of it you're not going to be able to carry that much of it gold in that situation is a much better alternative but how are you going to spend it um you know what do you need to leave in your house what do you not need to leave in your house that's the thing um, you know, my feeling about the whole thing, even though the panic was out there in the media, was that uh, I would be coming back and my house would be largely intact, had all the storm shutters up. It was built, that house, in 2002. So it was compliant with a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, current building codes. Didn't have impact glass, unfortunately. House I'm in now, impact glass will sustain 180 mile an hour hit and not break so or it might break but nothing will get in okay the window will stay so you know you have look you planning is imprecise here it's very very imprecise and it's it's to the person's needs if i wasn't with my friend i could have handled it a lot easier i wouldn't have brought as much water hmm. it's like we didn't need five cases of water um but you know then again you never know uh Hey, if you're at, if you bring a water filter with you, you'll be able to get water and filter it if you have to. So having a water filter really a good idea. Um, and then you know you you're gonna improvise. So having some semblance of a plan first is where it starts. And then you know you can have a checklist, an emergency checklist, and you go down the list of stuff. 
and from most important to least important. And, um, and then, you know, it's like, do you leave your car? Or do you go rent a car? Because uh, who knows what the damages are going to be mm. like. I opted to keep my car. But um, sometimes you might want to rent a truck because there could be a lot of trees coming down, a lot of debris on the road, and the truck will be better. So you, you have to figure it out for your area. Those people in the forest fires in California, I guarantee you that almost none of them had a real bug out plan, a real emergency plan. And that's why so many of them died. And, and it's easy to just do the plan. You know, if you don't want to buy emergency preparedness food, get some canned food. Um, cause it's all a question of, will you lose services in your house or will you have to flee your house? So mm -hmm. you really need two separate plans because if you need to flee your house, that's a whole different thing. If you can stay in place, that's a different thing and you know different things will come into play so definitely the idea of a generator at least um it's hard with gasoline powered generators because you got to go to the gas station then and fill up if you got a propane powered generator and just to keep on a few essential things uh, that could be the lifeline there but you always got to be careful so Having a generator, though, is definitely, um, you know, I think top of the list. And you can keep four or five, uh, you know, propane uh, containers there safely. I don't really like to keep them in the house, but you can do it. I mean, many people do. I always prefer, if it's possible, to leave them outside. Because mm -hmm. the thing is basically a bomb. Some people keep six and eight in my neighborhood. And that's a good thing. And, and then where you are on the grid, if you're near a police station, a hospital, school, your part of the grid's probably going to be more robust. But the hotel I was staying at in Orlando was right next to the airport, and it lost its power before my house in South Florida lost. But these are all things, don't drive yourself crazy about it, the basics, okay? Uh, have clothing for a few days, you know, have, uh, definitely have a weapon all right because you just don't know how people are going to freak out mm -hmm. how prepared they are because generally prepared people don't go crazy it's unprepared people that panic and that's the key is don't panic stay calm and that's the thing like we've talked about it before Donnie, and i've got anytime i go to a movie theater or a public place i always look for the emergency exits i, I want to know where they are even when I go to a hotel, they've got that nice little diagram on the inside of the door. Yeah. They've got it by the elevators. I'm not thinking that the place is going to burn down, but I'm thinking, you know, you never know. So being prepared and just knowing where the exits are can be the difference between life and death. Because when you know where the exits are and, and you're prepared and you've um, thought about these things, then you don't panic. And that might be the most important thing is that you don't panic in a given situation. You mentioned at the uh, rest stops for gas on the, on the turnpike that there were like state troopers there. Uh, and you mentioned earlier, like your uh, Dade uh, County uh, rated uh, door or Miami County rated doors on your garage. What about a County Sheriff? Did you find either at this time or any other time in the past that any uh, connection with or communication from or alliance with your County Sheriff was helpful to you? Um, you know, it, it kind of, Florida is kind of more prepared than most any other place for this type of situation for a hurricane. Um, so they're out there doing their thing and uh, they're going to be manning the emergency shelters. So, you know, you should know where the shelters are. They weren't exactly out there, but if they were there if you needed them, okay? So I didn't have any contact, but, you know, different areas would get messages and things from, from the sheriff's office. But look, when the storm is going on or the emergency, while it's actually happening, they're going to be uh, battening down the hatches and doing their best to shelter, and, uh, but then they're going to be out there. You know, there wasn't a lot of looting ever. You know, of course, right away it makes the news. Not a lot of that. 
you know, there's always some, you know, people taking advantage. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the uh, law enforcement, they're busy. They give advisories. I mean, the governor is like you know, the one thing Rick Scott is never a real fan of his. But, you know, they should have called him Hurricane Rick because when the hurricane was there, that guy was there and he was he had things under control. And, um, you know, he was a, a leader. So you look for leadership in these situations. Hopefully, you know, the governors have got their act together. But I just remember uh, the the governor of Louisiana when uh, Katrina hit. She was crying. She totally fell to pieces, was totally unable to deal with anything. No leadership whatsoever. Mm. Kathleen Blanco. She was totally incompetent. So, But you can't count on whether or not your governor, your mayor, is going to be a good leader and get us through, you got to count on yourself. And, you know, that's what's so great about what you do is, you know, really focusing people's attention on these possible situations that happen to millions of us in this country and around the world every year. And yet a mere fraction of you are prepared for any, any disaster fraction i've been noticing and and i guess anytime you start focusing on anything you start noticing more about it but i've been starting to notice more and more in what i would call mainstream um, media or on billboards or in the waiting room at urgent care or now on the cover of costco connection magazine that just came out talking about emergency preparedness as a normal thing that people should really be looking at and we had brad harris on from full spectrum survival and one of his quotes was the official warning will always come too late but i've been seeing a lot of official warnings recently as far as telling people that the basically the authorities who are even in charge of of emergency response are telling people you need to do your own preparedness. Basically, what you just said is yeah. that don't count on them to be there. The, the, the tooth fairy or the, the the blue fairy is not coming to bail you out when the time comes. You've got to have your own plans and your own preparedness uh, ready. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And like I say, in Florida, they're much more prepared than any other state. You know, obviously, we're not prepared for earthquakes because we don't have quakes. But when it comes to hurricanes and uh, you know storm surges and all of that. No place is better prepared than Florida and the Carolinas, Georgia, because we've been hit so many times, hundreds, over 100 storms, you know, in the past century or century and a half. Uh, so, yes, uh, government may be there and they may be functioning really well, but don't count on it. You can't count on it. Uh, and that's why you need to prepare yourself. And and this can be a neighbor thing as well um you know everybody thinks it's never going to happen to you it's not going to happen to me and uh you know then something like this happens and you realize yeah it uh wow it could really happen to me and and then you know the light bulb goes off so uh it's it's a combination it's a partnership uh sometimes this is when government functions best like when Maria hit here, there were the entire state virtually was w without power. Hmm. And there's this um, uh, compact, emergency management compact called EMCO or EMCO or something like that. And when a disaster hits a state, it enables a governor to call on the other governors um, to send, uh, send in the troops, whether it's the guard or uh, utility workers or whatever they need and this thing works amazingly amazingly well because as I was fleeing to Orlando I saw thousands of utility trucks hmm. thousands on the highway uh, stopping in Orlando because that's always the central command post in Florida not knowing that the hurricane was going to hit there but didn't hit that badly and you know government really can work best in these times but if I was in New York, I wouldn't be expecting government to uh, to really work well. If I'm in, uh, you know, upstate New York, yeah, it might well work. It might work better. If I'm in an isolated area, you know, I'm on my own for a while. You know, you see what happens, uh, you know, in Houston. Hey, they were out there. It really worked uh, during, uh, what was that, Hurricane 
Um, I don't remember which hurricane it was. There were so many. That well, Irma made it over there for sure. Irma. Harvey before that, yeah. Harvey. Hurricane Harvey, that's right. Harvey, I mean, hey, the, that really worked. I mean, it was a combination of people and government. So as much as we might be uh, libertarians and such and, uh, you know, wish the government would do a lot less in many areas, you know, this was an area in Texas where, hey, it all came together. Government really worked. And I guess we should applaud that because it gives one a little bit of hope when you see that happen. But, you know, obviously we're not counting on, you know, government because you don't know when it's going to work and when it's not. If it's really bad, uh, they might not be there. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to be prepared to to work it out on your own. And, you know, like in chess, they say there's nothing wrong with an honorable retreat. There's nothing wrong with an honorable evacuation if that is your best choice. Could we turn our attention just for a minute or two to the uh, geo-economic scene? We've, you mentioned earlier a flight to gold recently, perhaps being influenced by a flight, uh, a risk off play. Um, we've seen turmoil in the uh, major stock markets over the past year. Uh, and what do you and your guests that you have interviewed have to say about the real risks of, for example, the trade wars between the U.S. and China and uh, other uh, what's been told, uh, described as a global economic slowdown with uh, profit warnings coming from major, major uh, companies that are announcing earnings at this season. And yet, uh, more recently, for the last month, the stock market's gone mostly up. Uh, but... Uh, what are, you, what are you seeing in terms of major uh, macroeconomic risks going forward? Okay. So it's interesting because I'm trying to write an article. I just haven't been in a writing mood the past few months, you know, just uh, things happening. But I wanted to write an article basically entitled, Who's Right? So on the one hand, you have Martin Armstrong, the legendary forecaster. I mean, he's been right so many times. Um, I look back at the current bull market in stocks, and we're still in a bull market, in my opinion. Uh, where it's heading, I don't know. And, you know, everybody has been down on this bull market except him. And who's been right? He was right for 10 years. I mean, and I've been interviewing him for just over seven years, and he's been right on the money. Now, maybe not as he was saying it was going to go up to 39,000 and then 42. His feeling is. This is a blip. In the end, uh, the sovereign debt and everything else is no place to put your money, and everybody is going to kind of become aware of you got to have tangibles. Stocks are a tangible. Whether you wind up with your certificate or not at the end of the day, I can't tell you if there's a systemic uh, problem. But he's been right. And Nick Santiago, who basically... Um, called the market high I think it was in uh, 2007 uh, to the day and then called the low in 2009 within five days he says it's a blip okay but then I got Danielle Park who's a pretty savvy investor and she says it's breaking down not going to happen and I have 10 other people who say you know the bull market's over and there certainly are some technical reasons to think it might be. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing I know is that uh, what most people think invariably is wrong. So in all likelihood, there's a good possibility this market will continue onward and upward for the indefinite future because there will come a point where you don't want to put your money in bonds. You don't want to keep it in cash. You don't want sovereign debt because... Sovereign debt always goes bad. So it could very well go on indefinitely. I don't think the China-U.S. trade dispute has anything to do with anything other than an attempt to check China's geopolitical ambitions. And honestly, Trump, uh, I think, has done it pretty masterfully at exactly the right time, the right place, fits in with the North Korea thing, um, I think that uh, that the Chinese uh, are flummoxed. They don't know how to deal with a, uh, a President Trump. They are clueless. You know, Obama 
if you remember, uh, he went to China uh, a year or so before the end of his term, before it expired, and you know they didn't even wheel out uh, the steps for him to take it, so he could get off of Air Force One. He had to go out the belly of Air Force One and the built-in steps there, mm-hmm. which is humiliation. You know they aren't pulling that stuff on Trump, so I don't know that Trump can uh, solve all of our debt problems. Uh, there was just an article today in in um, Zero Hedge, and uh, said 75 largest cities are bankrupt. You know they're insolvent, and uh, when you take into account all their obligations, their pension and medical mm-hmm. obligations to their former employees, they're bankrupt. So. How does he get us out of that? Illinois bankrupt, uh, Connecticut bankrupt. Um, California. California, of course, California. Uh, you know, just uh, Massachusetts. All these states are really insolvent. I don't know how he gets us out of this. You can't grow your way out of insolvency, you know? Uh, people don't grow their way out of being broke. They go bankrupt and then they start over. Mm. That's the way that's done. So, you know, uh, none of this is anything new. It's been this way, but it's gotten much worse. Nothing's been done to address it. So it has to become a crisis. And then what's going to happen? I don't know, but I know that uh, the system has to change. That's why I'm calling it the new, new economy. In the past 10 years, we've been in the new economy where none of the rules worked that used to work. Now we're going into the new new economy, and who can tell what it's what it's going to be? I have no idea. Well, Kerry, we've been speaking with. Can you let people know if they visit financialsurvivalnetwork.com what they're going to find there and what they can sign up for? Sure. Hey, you sign up there, you get our newsletter. We've got thought leaders who've been talking about what we're going through now for ten years. They've been doing it longer than I have, and. You know, they don't tell you what to do, but they make you think and come up with ideas on how to get through what we're going to go through. I think another crisis, probably inevitable. I don't know how it will materialize. Black Swan, Catalyst, I don't know. So you get a few free reports, one on medical care, 11 medical hacks that can save you thousands of dollars every year. I mean, I've saved from this hack list, probably sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 over the past five years. Um, and you get a thing on where do you can, depending where you are in the country, places where you can store your precious metals for free and have 24-7 access to them, which is pretty cool when you think about it. And, um, and then we got a cryptocurrency report. I'm very bearish on cryptos. I think that the current crop of cryptos are going to be worthless, and um, I'm writing a paper on that now. But we have a good crypto paper that will teach you the basics of it, how to buy it, and uh, you know reasons why you should think about it. Not that you should have none, but just you should be aware that there are vulnerabilities in the platform that uh, that could render it worthless one day if the powers that be decide to do that. So. That's about it, but the newsletter is great because then you get everything we do every week in one place. Thank you for also plugging us into Dr. Elena George uh, out of Atlanta and her advocacy for uh, low-cost health care and how to, how to be radically depart from the system that's, that's extorting from all of us. So uh, it's a great connection you shared with us. I appreciate that. Uh, Elena is the best, and she's the one that uh, wrote the top 11 medical hacks. And if you got any hacks or anything, any information you want to contact me, just email me kl at kerry, K-E-R-R-Y, Lutz, L-U-T-Z dot com. And we answer all email. I've been a little bit slow recently. <laughs> so, Well, Kerry, as always, thank you for joining us on Reluctant Preppers. And uh, if we get any comments below that need your attention, we'll make sure to send them your way. So thank you once again for joining us. Be delighted. It's always great to come on the show, Donegan, and uh, hey, good luck with it, and good luck to everyone out there. Thanks, Kerry. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah, I heard that. 
Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your first ounce of silver at spot price and free shipping on any order over $99 at sdbullion.com slash rp. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.